You know, every Sunday, every Sunday we hold up our Bibles and we make confession about the Lord of God. I have been struggling with this message this week. Not struggling to put it together, but struggling to have the intestinal fortitude to deliver it. Um, so when we make our confession today, I know that we, we say, say it like you mean it, and mean it like you say it. That should hold true every Sunday, but I'm asking that this Sunday hold especially true, okay? So let's hold up our Bible and let's make our confession. And again, say it like you mean it, mean it like you say it. Here we go. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. And I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. And I can be what it says I can be. I can be what it says I can be. And I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. Turn to uh, turn to Jeremiah chapter seven. Jeremiah chapter seven. And as you turn, the Bible says the very heart doeth good like medicine. I don't know about y'all. I need some medicine this morning. Amen. So if you don't receive the medicine because you don't like the way it tastes, that's okay. I'll, I'll take it all this morning. All right. All right, remember these are just jokes. Please don't take offense. Don't blow up my email or the church's voicemail because you didn't like the jokes. They're just, just, they're just that, okay? All right, a man was sitting in a bar and he'd been drinking quite a few. He decided it was about time to go home, so when he stood up, he found himself on the floor. A little aggravated, he got back up, slightly leaning, and falls again right out the exit door. And again, he picks himself up, only to fall outside by the curb. He begins to look around, he thinks to himself, my house isn't that far from here, I'm just gonna crawl home. Next morning his wife says, you were out drinking again last night, weren't you? He says, How, how'd you know? She says, the bar called and said you left your wheelchair there. <laughs> there by the grace of God, go on. That was courtesy of Brother Daryl. The rest of these are from Sister Janelle. One's for me, the first one, and I saw this on online. So. The inventor of the doorbell obviously did not own a chihuahua. Right? I read that 4,153,237 people got married last year. Now, I'm not trying to cause any trouble, but shouldn't that be an even number? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, a man knocked on our door and asked for a small donation towards the local swimming pool. So I went to the kitchen and got a glass of water. <laughs> I want to die peacefully in my sleep like my grandfather. Not, not screaming and yelling like the passengers in his car. <laughs> this one should ring true with a lot of us here. I find it ironic that the colors red, white, and blue stand for freedom until they're flashing in your rearview mirror. <laughs> this may hit home with some of us. I know it does me. Relationships are a lot like algebra. Have you ever looked at your ex and wondered why? <laughs> Again, this is just, just a joke. Please don't take offense. You're not fat. You're just easier to see. <laughs> I didn't make these up, okay? If you think nobody cares whether you're alive or not, try missing a couple of payments. 
My 50-year kindergarten reunion is coming up soon. I'm kind of worried about the 175 pounds I've gained since then. Denny's has a slogan. If it's your birthday, the meal is on us. If you're at Denny's and it's your birthday, your life kind of sucks. Right? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, the pharmacist asked me my birthday again today. Pretty sure she's going to get me something this year. For some of us who are older, you're going to love this one. The location of your mailbox shows how far away from your house you can be in a robe before you start looking like a mental patient. <laughs> Last one. Anybody remember the Andy Griffith show, right? Yeah. The reason the town of Mayberry was so peaceful and quiet was because nobody was married. Now think about this. Andy, right? Andy, Barney, Floyd, Howard, Goober, Gomer, Sam, Ernest T. Bass, Helen, Phil Malou, Claire, and of course Opie. We're all single. The only married person was Otis, and he stayed drunk. Amen. Mm. All right, Jeremiah chapter 7. I am going to start this off, but before I start this off, I'm going to tell you guys, I am coming from a position of love because I love and care for every, each and every one that's here. And I don't want you to miss out on eternal life in paradise. Okay? So that being said, please, please, please take to heart what I say today, okay? We're going to start at verse 1, but before we start at verse 1, I want to give you a little bit of background. Jeremiah was probably the most humble prophet in the Old Testament. His heart was broken because of the condition of Israel. And on more than one occasion, Jeremiah wept openly for his people. He was one of the very few voices in Israel that continually spoke the truth to the people of God. And while most of the teachers in Israel were caught up in sin and lying to the people about their true condition, and failing to warn them of the dire consequences of continuing in that sin, Jeremiah stood firm and true. The lie. He was not well received. Now this is because people didn't want to hear the truth. The truth hurts sometimes. But the truth is the truth, whether it hurts or not. I'm not going to stand here if your pants are on fire and you say, it's hot or my pants are on fire. Or are they on fire? I'm not going to say, no, they're not. Right? The lies of those who spoke made them feel better and they just didn't want to hear the words of Jeremiah at the time. There's an old saying that says that history repeats itself and if we fail to learn from the lessons of the past, then we are destined to repeat those lessons. And as I look around the church today, including our own, I wonder if some people just don't get it. The love of God is reaching out to a wayward people. The Holy Spirit is doing all He can to draw God's people into a place of close relationship with Jesus Christ. Trying to lead us in the paths of righteousness and revealing to us the ways of our Heavenly Father. But like Israel in the days of Jeremiah, I believe that so many of God's own people simply refuse to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be the sheep of God's pasture. But there's so many that don't even know the voice of the great shepherd as he calls out in love for them to come to a place of safety. That little voice that you hear inside that's telling you not to go down this path or to not do this, that's the Holy Spirit trying to keep you from getting it in your mess of your life. Notice as we go through these passages that all Jeremiah 
says is spoken directly to God's own people. He wasn't speaking to the Gentile nations. He wasn't speaking to those who had no knowledge of God. Those who are unbelievers are condemned already. Why should God condemn them more? God's heart is not set upon condemning mankind, but upon saving mankind. It's God's will that all men should fall on their face in repentance and that none should be lost. Think about this. God did not create man in his own, in, own image just to lose him to the clutches of sin. Right? God didn't create the eternal fires of judgment for the souls of men. He created the fires of judgment for the rebellious angels. If any man goes there, they will go by choice or by neglect of the great salvation that God has so wonderfully provided through Jesus Christ, His Son. Amen. I know, I know, I know you get tired of hearing this kind of message time and again, time and again, time and again. But I got convicted this last week by the Holy Spirit to speak it. Amen. And if I have to say it over and over until the day I die, so be it. Because that's what Jeremiah did in the Bible. God is still the same God now that He was in the days of Jeremiah. He has not changed. His love has not stopped. And His patience in waiting for the response of His people is the same. But, always know there's a but. Yeah, there's a but. But we also know that God's righteous judgments are the same as well. If God were to allow His church to continue in sin and not bring judgment upon the house of God, you know what He have to do? God would have to turn back the pages of history, raise every one of the souls of Israel who died without God in those days, and apologize to them for being an unjust God. For those among us who might think that we are perfect in our ways, and that we are innocent of all charges that God brings against His church. Let me remind you what Jesus said in Matthew 18, 12. He said, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? You can just see the great love of God reaching out and the tremendous value that He places on each and every soul of man in the next few verses after that, which we're going to get to. I have no doubt that a large majority of those of you sitting here today, your hearts are right with God. You constantly strive to keep the mind of Christ. And your greatest desire is to be so close to Jesus. Oh my goodness, this is going to sound familiar. We went to a revival last night, and I grabbed my wife by the hand, and we went up front, and not even realizing this is exactly what I asked for. Your greatest desire is to be so close to Jesus that you share the very heart of God. Amen. You cherish the love of God in your heart and soul, and there's nothing that could ever take the place of God's love. I have no doubt there's some of you in here today. But I also know that not all of us are as close to the heart of God as we should be. There are some wayward sheep around. Otherwise, I would not have been convicted to talk to you about this today. And it's you that God has directed this message for today. I'm telling you one more time, the great shepherd is calling you by name. One more time, the voice of the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. I don't know God's timetable for your life. But, just maybe this could be God's final call to your heart to turn back to Him in repentance. Do any of us have a guarantee that we're going to make it home from service? 
Don't get me wrong. I pray that everyone does. But when God's ready, when your time is up, it's up. After Matthew 18, 12, here's the next couple of verses that I referred to. And if he finds it, the lost sheep, I tell the truth, he will rejoice, rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. As much as God loves his people, his righteousness and his justice have to prevail. Preachers must preach the truth by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Not by a sermon outline that's given to you for the next year. Hello, certain churches. That burns me. Do you know that you can go, there's a certain denomination that you can go to one of their churches anywhere in the world and you hear the same message that they're preaching at every other one of their churches. It doesn't matter if you're in Spain or in California. You hear the same sermon every that's, that's preached that Sunday because there is a directive that comes out at the beginning of the year saying, here's your next 52 sermons in this order. I'm sorry, that's not the leading of the Holy Spirit, is it? Thank you. Now that I got off my soapbox, we'll continue. To fail to warn those who God loves so much to turn from their ways and walk in faithfulness to God would be the ultimate in disobedience and would be the greatest sin we could commit. Yes. To not continually bring the message of repentance of God's wayward sheep and to fail to reach out in every way possible to rescue them from the path that leads to destruction would be to miss the very heart of God would also miss the very center of the purpose of God for the ministry of all of His shepherds across the world. Anybody standing up here would be nothing but a false prophet and a hireling if they didn't care for the sheep and they failed to bring the message to the church every time the Holy Spirit desired them to do so. I want you to hear what God spoke to His people through this broken-hearted prophet named Jeremiah. God's heart was broken for the condition of His people, and God transmitted that brokenness through the heart of Jeremiah. So in Jeremiah chapter 7, let's look at uh, verses 1 and 2. Amen? New Living Translation says, The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, Go to the entrance of the Lord's temple and bring this message to the people. O oh, Judah, listen to this message from the Lord. Listen to it. All of you who worship here. Can there be any doubt that that message, that this message is for His own people? Like Jeremiah, I am standing here at the very gate of the Lord's house today to proclaim His word to you and reveal His word to those of you that have come to worship the Lord this morning. Verses 3 and 4. This is what the Lord of heaven, heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Even now, if you quit your evil ways, I will let you stay in your own land. Oh, don't be fooled by those who promise you safely, safe, safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant... The Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. Stop right there. In this time in Israel's history, there were many, many false prophets who were preaching in the temple. They were bringing lying spirits and doctrines of devils right into the very temple where God had established a system of worship for His people. The ritual of blood sacrifices continued as they had for many years Hmm. I'm going to sit in the same seat as I have for many years. The people kept coming to the temple, offering their sacrifices, bowing before God, and listening to the teachers as they read from the law. But something had changed in the very heart of their worship. Even though they were going through the motions, hmm, 
the true worship of God and the truth of God's law was perverted and the worship was shallow and meaningless. Amen. I'm going to raise my hands during this song, but I'm going to think about the work week I have ahead. I'm going to throw 20 bucks in the plate, even though that's not a tenth of my income this last week. Get the point? Mm. People were trusting in the lying words of the false teachers, and they were ignoring the truth of what God really wanted from them in their worship. What does God want from you in your worship to Him? I'll give you one word answer. Everything. Yes. Yes. Everything you have to give all the time. Yes. Their body continued to go through the motions, but their spirit and their hearts were far from God. There's something that we can't afford to miss in these verses. The false teachers were teaching it, and the people were believing it, and it was all a lie. Any of you that think we don't have any false teachers behind pulpits in America today, you are delusional. And I say that with love. Any of you that don't think there's any false teachers on TV are delusional. I have, I have scoured the New Testament, and I have still yet to find the phrase prosperity gospel in it. But there's people out there preaching it. There's people out there preaching that Jesus was a millionaire. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says he became poor so that we could have an abundant life. Right? Bibles printed, but they need to check that. There's again, there's something we can't afford to miss in these verses. So what was what was his great teaching? Right? From the beginning of the worship in the temple, the teaching had been that those who continually came at the appointed time, who continually offered their sacrifices, who bowed their head in reverence and did their duty to the temple were identified as the very temples of God. So the people that showed up at 1030 on Sunday morning, right? Uh, let's see what else. Who, who always tithe, um, who bowed their heads when we pray, who did, did, had a little ministry inside the church, whatever it may be. Those type of worshipers were called the very temple of God. Let's look into that a little bit. Therefore, we kind of hear Jeremiah say, you call yourselves the temple of God, but you're far from being the true temple of God. This is what's happening in the church today. I doubt that you will find one pastor anywhere in the church today around the world who won't stand in the pulpit and tell the people in the congregation that they are God's own people. Every pastor will say that. You are God's own people, right? No preacher wants to believe that the people of his church are hypocrites. No pastor wants to take the chance of losing a church member because he calls them unfaithful, untruthful, and sinners caught up in hypocrisy and denial of sin in their heart. No preacher wants to do that. Amen. Standing up here and I'm no different. I'd love to be able to stand here and bring you a wonderful message that cause you to believe that you're perfect in the eyes of God and that no one among us has a single problem in the eyes of God. But if I did that, not only would I be lying to you, I'd be lying to myself and I'd be lying to God as well. Pastors around the world are standing before their churches this morning and they are telling their congregations that all is well, that all of you are the temple of God, and that all of you have Jesus living in you. You have nothing to worry about. As long as you come to church and offer your tithes and offerings, and you do your duty around the church, then all will be well. After all, faithfulness to the house of God is what it's all about, right? Faithfulness to God's house makes you a part of God's family, so therefore, you're a part of his temple. Wrong. 
I am here to tell you that it takes more than faithfulness to God's house. Amen. It takes more than continually offering up sacrifices. Continually offering up service to Him. It takes more than coming to church on a Sunday morning yeah. to hear the Word of God. Don't get me wrong. Those are good works. For certain they're good works and we're very needful to the work of God. But works nonetheless. And good works are not enough to be called the temple of the Holy Spirit. It takes more than that. That should be a byproduct. Amen? What does it take to be a true temple of God? I'm going to tell you right now. Here it is. Ready? It takes a heart that is close to God's heart. It takes a mind that is in tune with the mind of Christ and a heart that is so in love with Jesus that your greatest desire in life is to be close to Jesus. That's what it takes. It takes a heart that is in continual repentance. Broken and godly sorrow for the many times that we fail and yet a faith that God has forgiven us so that we can walk before Him in victory. It takes a commitment to Christ that makes Jesus the first priority in your life. Above your family, above your friends, and above anything else. Anything less and we become hypocrites. I thank God that I have a wife that doesn't get mad or jealous or upset because I want to spend time in the Word. I thank God I have a wife that says, I'm okay being second place to God. Amen. So thank you. How can we claim to be the chosen people of God if we haven't chosen Him to make, to make Him Lord of our lives? How can we say that we love God above all else and then let everything else take the place that God desires to have in our hearts? Mm. Verses 5 through 7 in Jeremiah chapter 7. This is God talking still. He says, But I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop your murdering. And only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. Then I will let you stay in this land that I gave to your ancestors to keep forever. God is not a God of a one-way street. He will give more than what He expects from us. But He still expects from us. If any of you have had children, do you not expect from them? Have you met... Okay, I need to word this very carefully. Have you ever met families where the parents never expected a thing from their children? How did those children act? Not very well behaved, right? And I think I'm putting that mildly. Now, I read from the New Living Translation, and it may be a little confusing, so I'm going to kind of put the James Translation on it. You have to thoroughly repent and do only those things that are pleasing to God. You have to thoroughly judge your own heart and fully examine and perfect the way that you treat people and how you talk to them. We have to stop putting down one another and quit speaking things that put one another down. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of joking that goes on and I love it. I love the good humor. You don't go to church with your head down and your hands clasped in front of you walking in like you're walking into a funeral. You should be happy to be here. In fact, I would say you better be happy to be here. Do you know there's people in other parts of the world that die for having what we have right now? Yes. But sometimes, and I've been, I've been the recipient of this and I've been the instigator of this, sometimes we take joking a little too far and when we do, people get hurt. 
We also have to have compassion for the lost. For they are without a heavenly father and they are basically orphans or widows, if you will. We have no one to provide for their spiritual needs. This is also talking about backsliders and lukewarm Christians who are far from the heart of God and can't hear His voice when they call upon Him. Instead of speaking evil of them or cutting them down because of their unfaithfulness or complaining about any privileges that they might have in the church, we ought to intercede for them in prayer and do all we can to encourage them. remind you why. Because Jesus said, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. I don't know about you, but including me, I don't see anybody in here who qualifies to throw the first stone. Amen. When we feel like we have to talk about someone or cut them down or gossip about them, we are playing right into the hands of the devil. We may as well guilty of shedding their blood. And I'll tell you something about that. If we continue in that action, we may, we may well face God with their blood on our hands for driving them away from church. God says that if we will mend our ways and purify our hearts and love our fellow man as God loves us, and then love Jesus and serve Him with all our heart, then we can be counted as part of the temple of God. It requires nothing less than a full commitment of all that we are to Jesus Christ. Anything less is hypocritical. And you won't be called, and you can't be called the temple of God. Let's look at verses 8 through 11 now. Don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because the temple is here. It's a lie. Do you really think you can steal, murder, commit adultery, lie, and burn incense to Baal and all those other new gods of yours and then come here and stand before me in my tem temple and chant, we are safe, only to go right back to all those evils again? Don't you yourselves admit that this temple, which bears my name, has become a den of thieves. Surely I see all the evil going on there. I, the Lord, have spoken. Stop right there. There are a lot of people in church who have trusted in the words of lying teachers. Words that can't profit at all. People come to church every week having stolen. Not only stolen from their fellow man, but also from God Himself. They've stolen the blessings of God and squandered them upon their own selfish desires and lusts. They have stolen the time that God has given to them to serve Him and have used that time to just kind of do their own thing. They have committed spiritual adultery and even in some cases, physical adultery. They've taken other things into their hearts that take the place of God and have made those things into idols, whether it's their spouse, their children, all the little toys that they own, jet skis, dirt bikes, big old pickup trucks, sports cars, whatever. Sometimes their job is their idol. Well, I'm a lawyer. Great. If I follow my God, I'll probably never need your service, but great, okay? Anything that, listen, if you don't hear anything else, if you don't hear anything else I've said, listen to this one sentence. Anything that carries a greater significance in your life than being faithful to God becomes your God and causes you to commit spiritual adultery. We come to God's house claiming that we are His people, yet our heart is far from Him and our actions prove that. We haven't given Jesus an hour of attention all week. We haven't read His Word even once, and yet we claim that we love Him and we love His Word. We make promises to God that we'll do better next week, but how often are those promises kept? That is called burning incense to Baal. 
You might say that you don't do any such thing, but let me ask you a question. Don't answer unless you're really brave. How much electricity and energy have you burned watching TV? Or playing games or listening to ungodly music? Are you burning incense to an idol? Are you walking after, following after, and paying more attention to the gods of this world than to the God of heaven? Then we come into the house of God or church on Sunday morning. We say, I'm delivered from sin. I'm free from idols in my life. I'm a born again child of God. And I'm a faithful servant of Christ. We live like hell six days a week and go to God on the seventh. Uh -huh. That ain't the way God wants the church. How do you think that makes God feel? You live like hell Monday through Saturday. And then you come into his church, his house on Sunday and say, okay, your grace. His, how would you feel if your own children did the same thing? They went out and robbed and murdered and cheated and lied and stole six days a week and came home one day and said, okay, I'm home. You love me, right? Of course you love them. But you don't excuse what they've been doing. How God's heart must ache for His people who are blinded by the lies of their own heart. How the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God must be grieved to see people walking in sin and yet denying living in that sin. How the heart of God must ache to hear His people Worship Him in spirit and in truth and not only with their mouths. Do we not believe that God sees our true condition? Do you thank the God that the universe is measured by the width of the palm of His hand doesn't know your heart? Doesn't know what you do that you think people don't know you do? I'm not trying to beat you up. I love you guys. I'm trying to give you the truth here. Don't we understand that God sees past our little facades and sees it in the very deepest part of our heart? Don't we understand that God knows the difference between a true believer and one that has a spirit of hypocrisy? Look at verse 12. Go now, go now to the place at Shiloh where I once put the tabernacle that bore my name. See what I did there because of all, of all the wickedness of my people, the Israelites. Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle of Moses was set up and a place where God had decided to come down and dwell among His people in the earth. The very presence of Almighty God was in the midst of the camp. The great love of God was reaching out to fallen man, making every attempt to be a father to his people. There was kept the law of God. There was found the Ark of the Covenant, marking God's great promises to Abraham and to Israel. There was found all of the articles of the tabernacle that pointed to the coming of a Savior that would redeem mankind from his sin and give him a way back to heaven and into the very presence of his loving Father. But because of the refusal of Israel to repent and her continual idolatry and disobedience, God deserted the tabernacle. And he allowed its holy vessels to be stolen away forever. The tabernacle of God's presence disappeared from Israel, and even though they kept up a form of worship, God was not in it. Do you know how many churches there are in this country and in this world that God's not in it? Because they come in and they go through the motions. Here's my vision of a church. You ready real quick, and then we'll get back to this. My vision of a church is a place where you go and God has His way. Amen. Right? Yes. Yes. There may be a sermon. Yes. There may not. Yes. There may be an hour or two of nothing but prayer. There may be an hour or two of nothing but praising and worship, worshiping God through music. Yes. 
There may be an hour or two of testimonies. My point is, it will be God's will. If God just wants us to sit there for an hour and a half and not say a word, so be it. If God wants us to run around the building seven times, so be it. Because He doesn't do anything unless He does it for a purpose. Right? My point in telling you all of this, and I'm, I'm wrapping up right now, I think, I think God is giving, or is close to giving what I call His final call. I don't know, and none of us know, how long God will continue this call to repentance and this call to turning back to Him. But there, I do know this, there will, mark my words, will come a day when the call to be a part of the true bride of Christ will come to an end. Yeah. The church will be gone. Yeah. And those left behind will be left to a world of delusion, lies, deception. There will be little hope of survival. God is getting ready for the rapture. Are you? Are you? God loves you too much to allow you to go into judgment without giving you every opportunity to turn around. But like road signs on a highway, every warning can be given in every direction shown to get you to your final destination. But if you ignore the signs and end up lost, it's not the fault of the signs. It's not the fault of the one that built the highway. The fault is ours. Amen. If we fail to read, fail to listen, fail to heed the warning. Amen. And all that failing leads to destruction. Two questions when I close. Is God calling you out? Do you hear his final call? Here's what I, we're going to do something a little different. God laid this on my heart to do it, so y'all want to throw rocks at me. Wait till after service is over. I'm going to have Don play a song. I'm going to have him turn off all the lights except for the chandeliers. And during this song, if you want to stay in your seat, that's fine. If you want to come up to the altar, that's fine. Get right with God if you're not 100% right with Him. Give everything to God if you haven't given Him 100%. And after that song, I'm going to lead everybody in a prayer which you can say with me or you can say to yourself or you can not say anything. It's up to you. Okay? Deal? Okay.